Support for this program comes from listeners like you. To find out more, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com. First Corinthians chapter 12, as we continue with our chapter-by-chapter study of First Corinthians. In First Corinthians 12, we will look at what Paul had to say concerning spiritual gifts. This is really an, a neat chapter to study and to teach from because I think you can easily divide it up into three categories or three sections. First, One spirit, many gifts. One spirit, many gifts. Second, one body, many members. And third, one ecclesia, many functions. So there you have it. One spirit, many gifts. One body, many members. One ecclesia, many functions. So these analogies and these illustrations are helpful to us as we try to understand what Paul has to say about spiritual gifts, and it's uh, actually a very good example of how he will take something specific. We don't know exactly what these specific questions they had were, but Paul will take something specific, and he will generalize a principle for us to follow. So um, I, I don't think Paul was a micromanager. I don't think that he was lost in the details. He didn't allow... Uh, specifics to distract him from the main purpose and the main principle that he wanted to communicate to them. And uh, all of this, as I say, is leading up to that great love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13, but he has been referencing love, edifying one another, building one another up, uh, doing all things for profitable purposes, not in terms of what I can get, but what I can give. And um, so all of these principles have to do with love. So uh, as we consider that, and as he begins to answer questions about spiritual gifts, it actually gives him a great platform to begin talking about this great revelation of one body in Christ, that we are many members, but we are one body in Christ. And of course, that is merely a way of illustrating the spiritual nature of of the ecclesia, the spiritual nature of our fellowship in the Son, S-O-N, that although we are many different people spread out across the geography of the earth and across 24 different time zones, nevertheless, we are still one ecclesia. Now, in your in your uh, Bibles, it will say one church. God has appointed these in the church. And again, if you're new to this word, uh, ecclesia is simply the Greek word that has been translated church, but the Greek sense of that word is not the sense of a religious institution or a building. Ecclesia simply means the called out assembly or the assembly of those who have been called out. It always referred to people, never to a system, never to a building, never to a denomination, but always to a family, a people who are called out Uh, in in the beginning. And in some parts in Scripture, it just means anyone who's called together for any purpose. It can even be applied to a mob when a mob of people gathered around and and were trying to stone Paul. It is referred to as an ecclesia. (laughs) But certainly uh, that is not the sense in which in which Paul And the other writers in the New Testament begin to use this word ecclesia to refer to the called out assembly of people who are following Jesus in spirit and in truth. Now, the question is, what are you called out from? And when we trace that in Scripture, we see that we are called out of many things, called out of darkness and into his marvelous light, called out of the world and called into a kingdom made without hands, a spiritual kingdom, and what I call an an irresistible kingdom that 
Daniel, the book of Daniel says, will destroy all other kingdoms and will become a great mountain that covers the whole face of the earth. Uh, that's a that's a marvelous way of thinking about this irresistible kingdom of God and how we have been called out of the world and called into this spiritual kingdom. And I also believe when you look in the book of Revelation where uh, God says, come out of her, my people. God has called us out of the harlot church system. He has called us out of dead religion, and he has called us into a living, breathing relationship with Christ. And um, so he has called us out of sin, and he has called us into sanctification. So we are called out of many things, and it is the gathering of those who have been called out that constitutes the ecclesia. So that's a new word for some people, and um, well, I can't do a whole word study on that, but you need to understand that when Scripture talks about church, it's not talking about the building on the corner with the steeple on top where they have religious services. It's always referring to an assembly of people, a gathering of people. And in Paul's use of it in 1 Corinthians 12, especially, we see that it is a spiritual fellowship consisting of many members. So there are local ecclesias, the ecclesia in Corinth, the ecclesia in Ephesus, the ecclesia in Thyatira. We see all of that uh, recorded for us in the book of Revelation, the seven letters to the seven ecclesias. So there are individual ecclesias, but still all together they constitute and form one ecclesia, one body of Christ, joined together by one spirit. So we see this illustrated for us very nicely in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So let's start reading in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Okay, so the reason this came up and the reason it was necessary for Paul to say, I don't want you to be ignorant, is because in the past they had been Gentiles and they had been idol worshipers. The uh, Greeks, of course, you know Greek mythology, they had a whole system of gods and goddesses, and they had temples and they had idols. And so uh, Paul says, this is different. So unlike those dumb idols that you once were carried away with, and by dumb there, it's it's a reference not to uh, stupidity, it's a reference to muteness, or it's it's, uh, indicating that these idols uh, could not speak. They couldn't express themselves. They weren't speaking uh, or having a, a conversation or a, even trying to attempt a relationship with you. They were just inanimate objects, dumb idols who could not speak, certainly couldn't see or could not hear. So what he is wanting to say to them concerning spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be ignorant because unlike these dumb idols, that you used to serve, now you serve a living God, and he is alive, and he speaks by his Spirit. So the question is, does God still speak today? And it's a valid question, because there are so many people who 
believe that God was very active in speaking in so many centuries past. And some people wrote down the things that God said into a book that we call the Bible. And then as soon as that, as the last part of the Bible was written, God, who had been speaking all of these centuries, suddenly stopped speaking. And now the only word that we have, the only way that God speaks is through the scriptures. And so in a way, I I don't want to carry this to too far of an extreme, but in a way, it's almost as though we have taken the Bible and we have made that an idol in the sense that we don't believe, some don't believe, I certainly do, some do not believe that God still speaks today or that whatever God had to say has already been said, it's already been written down. And here's the challenge that I have with that. The challenge of that is, if God does not speak, and everything that God wishes to say has already been said, and if it has already been written down in a book, and translated into so many different translations and versions, we don't need a relationship with God to know what God wants to say, to know what God has to say. All we have to do is take this book off of the shelf, read it and study it, and we know everything there is to know about God. And while I certainly believe that the scriptures are the word of God, and I believe that the scriptures can't be broken, I believe that everything written in scripture is truth and should be taught, to say that everything that God wants to say and everything that God intended to say has already been said and has already been written in a book, If that were the case, then you and I would not need a living relationship with God. Why, we could simply just pick up the Bible and read and see what God thinks, see what God says, and if we don't find what we're looking for in the Bible, then we just say, well, the Bible doesn't talk about it, and so uh, therefore we can't know. And I would say that if you take that to an extreme, and you believe that God no longer speaks unless he speaks through Scripture, then you then you have, at that point, idolized the Bible and elevated the written Word of God, of God above the living Word of God. So just by way of illustration, I have written how many books? 16, 17, 18 books. Those books contain my words, Uh, They are true in the sense that they represent what I believe to the best of my ability at the time that I wrote them. And they are valid expressions of my thoughts on different subjects. But to assume that because you have read one of my books or that you have read even all of my books, to assume that because you've read my writings, you understand me as a person or that you have an actual relationship with me just because you have read my books, well, that would be naive of anyone to think that. To think that you know everything there is to know about me because you've read one of my books, or even all of my books, it doesn't, that cannot contain the whole essence of who I am. And I would suggest to you that the the Bible is infallible. It is the Word of God. Every Word of God is pure. Every Word of God is truth. And the the scriptures uh, more, I I have a higher regard for scripture and for scripture teaching, I think, than uh, many in this modern time where I am concerned that they have completely disregarded the scriptures and they just want to be led by a cloud. They want to be led by visions and dreams and and they have no no, uh, desire to even see if what they are proclaiming and teaching is actually lines up with the scriptural uh, revelation. So the Bible contains the word of God, and the Bible contains a revelation of God. But to think that everything that God has ever said, everything that God has ever revealed, is all said and all revealed in the pages of the Bible, and then God stopped speaking and revealing for the last 2,000 years, It suggests that we don't even need to know God. We don't have to pray. We don't even need the Holy Spirit. We just go to the Bible and we learn 
we we memorize verses or we study different books or we dissect the original languages and we treat the scripture as uh, as something that is going to speak to us because the living God is either unable or unwilling to speak to us by his Holy Spirit. So I'm saying we've got to find a balance somewhere in the middle. We have to reverence, respect, study, and and love the Word of God, the written Word of God, but not believe that everything that God is and everything that God wishes to, to say has been completely and thoroughly and once and for all contained within the 66 books of the Bible, 1,189 chapters. Uh, this, I would say to you, is a beginning. And I would say that in order to, to know the living God, you certainly have to know the written word of God. Uh, but you, Paul's, Paul's challenge to them is you used to worship idols that could not speak. Now you worship a living God who yet speaks and does speak and does reveal by his Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, there's much more that I want to teach you, but you're not able to handle it. However, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will lead you into all truth. He will not speak of himself, but he would testify of me and he will, re he will reveal that which is mine to you. So that's why every time we pray, we, I, I ask Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher, lead us and guide us into all truth. And, uh, that is acknowledging while we revere and we acknowledge and we reverence and have respect for the written word of God, there is much more that God wishes to show us. Now, I think the foundation is there, and I don't think God's going to lead us in a direction that contradicts Scripture. Uh, but you will be surprised when you look at Scripture how God often led people in different directions and they would protest. Well, you know, this does not line up with Scripture, <laughs> like, and, uh, like Peter, you know. Uh, where he has the vision of the clean and the un or the unclean animals being let down from heaven, he hears a voice that says, "Get up, Peter, kill and eat." And Peter says, "Not so, Lord. I've I have never eaten any unclean things or unclean animals. I've never broken the law." And God says, well, "Whatever I say is clean, is clean. What I call clean, don't call unclean." And so it looks like, well, you know, God's or something is leading Peter in a direction that's contrary to scripture. But usually this is so good. I, I hope that you grasp this. Usually what's happening is it's not when you hear something that sounds a little bit off, not all the time, but sometimes when you hear something that your first reaction is, well, that doesn't line up with the Bible. Very often it's not lining up with your interpretation of the Bible. It's not lining up with your understanding of scripture. And God can very often want to lead us in a certain direction, but if we elevate Scripture above the Spirit, then we would do like Peter did, and we would protest. Well, I, I can't do that, Lord, because I've never done any. I've never eaten anything that's unclean. Because doesn't the, doesn't the Bible give a whole list of things I'm not supposed to eat? Now you're telling me that it's okay to eat. And I think that is very <laughs> illustrative. Of course, it wasn't about eating and drinking. It had to do with preaching the good news of Jesus to somebody other than the Jews. It had to do with reaching out to the Gentiles. It had to do with bringing this good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God to the world and not just to those there in Jerusalem. So again, it's never about the thing. It's always about the thing behind the thing. And the thing behind the thing in this case was trying to get Peter to go beyond preaching Jesus to Jews and realize that I am sending you into all the world. And so that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful story. And it illustrates how we must reverence and, and have respect for the written word of God, but not think that everything God is doing is contained within Scripture, and even worse, when God tries to lead us and, and take us deeper into all truth and begin to show us things that he wasn't able to show us before, and then we protest on the grounds of Scripture that God can't do something. <laughs> right? <laughs> Well, you know, it's like uh, God. God does. We should pray for all men, 
for all mankind. Prayers or supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks for all men, because God desires all men to be saved and to come to the full knowledge of truth. And Christ gave himself as a ransom for all men to be testified in due time. But then to say, well, God desires all men to be saved, but God can't save all people because uh, what about hell and what about eternal punishment? And you're using scripture to argue against something that God says he wants to do. Instead, we should look and find ways to adjust our interpretation so that we are in alignment with God's spirit and God's heart and God's thought and not try to use the Bible as a legal document to fight against God's will. (laughs) Well, there's lots of illustrations I could use. That was the first one that came up because that seems to be something that... um, it seems to to cause people to stumble quite a bit, but it's it's um, it's indicative of the fact that we need balance. We need to have the reverence and respect for Scripture, and that's why I, I teach Scripture. We go through a chapter a week because it's important. Um, at the same time, we serve a living God, and He speaks by His Spirit, and I trust that He will speak inside of His Word as as well as using the Word and going from there to lead us into all truth, even leading us into places uh, that uh, w- that we're not comfortable with, that we're not familiar with, and certainly leading us into areas of truth that contradicts the religious tradition that we've been taught. So the, the main purpose of this is to illustrate the fact that there are different gifts, but one spirit. Different gifts, but one spirit. Different ministries, but the same Lord, different activities, but the same God who works all in all. And notice how Paul is using a sort of, uh, well, not a sort of, he's, he is alluding to the Trinity here. He says there are different gifts, but one spirit, different ministries, but the same Lord and Lord. He's referring to the Lord Jesus, of course, and then different activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. So you have, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I just thought that was interesting and and neat. Uh, But the point is there are different gifts and different ministries and different activities, but all bound together by the same Spirit, by the same Lord Jesus, and by the same God who works all in all. So what is the purpose of these gifts? What is the purpose of these manifestations? And the purpose in verse 7, it says that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For the profit of all. So uh, what God gives you and how God uses you is not to glorify yourself. It's not to, it's not to build yourself up. Although, for example, we'll talk about in 1 Corinthians 14, when Paul is talking about the gifts of the gift of tongues. That tongues, the gift of of speaking languages unknown uh, that are unlearned, but by the spirit you're speaking, you are speaking mysteries, speaking in an unknown language by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Well, Paul says, when you do that, you edify yourself. And there's nothing wrong with edifying yourself. Uh, But the, the point is that these gifts, when you come together and you use them, They are to to be used for the edification of one another. And that's the sense in which he's talking about here. What is the purpose of those gifts? They are given to each one for the profit of all, for the profit of everybody. So these gifts are not to be used in isolation and not to be used uh, for the purposes of building myself up exclusively. Although I got to tell you, when I use my gift of teaching, I, I love it. I am strengthened. When I do that, when I when I speak in tongues, I edify myself and there's nothing wrong with edifying and building up yourself as long as you realize that God gives us these gifts, not exclusively for our benefit, but for the benefit of everybody in the body of Christ. He he works through us so that we can build up and and encourage and strengthen one another. So. These things, these manifestations of the Spirit, it says in verse 7, that they are all given for the profit of all, for the profit of everyone. And so these spiritual gifts are intended to edify and build up one another in love, 
to edify, to build up, to encourage, to strengthen one another in love through the operation of the spiritual gifts. Now, if we will do that, then, of course, your needs are going to be met. You are going to be edified and built up as you learn to receive from the giftedness of other people. And as we will see as we continue on in the chapter, all of us have something to offer. All of us have something to give. So long as we are one body in Christ, all of us have some kind of a gift. So Paul lists nine different manifestations or nine different gifts of the Spirit and I just find it interesting that he he names nine different ones, and it's similar to the nine fruit of the Spirit that he lists in Galatians chapter 5. So nine gifts of the Spirit, similar to the nine fruit of the Spirit. So that's just interesting uh, in, in the sense that it is the same, uh, the, the same number. Uh, but here's, here's the thing that I would bring up at this point, and it's this, that we have made too much of the gifts and not enough of the fruit. And especially in the charismatic movement in the uh, early to mid to late 20th century, um, I think people rediscovered the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They rediscovered the gifts of the Spirit. Uh and and that was exciting and that was good and and that was a wonderful thing to witness however i think that in the process we we became too focused on the spiritual gifts and we lost sight of the spiritual fruit so what i would say to you is that spiritual gifts do not equal spiritual fruit and gifts Spiritual gifts do not equal spiritual maturity. So when you look at the Corinthians, you see, for example, um, in the beginning of this letter, remember, they've got some serious problems. They have some serious sin in the camp, and they've got, they've got a lot of growing up to do. So they're immature, and they're not bringing forth the fruit. There's divisions among them, and, and there's arguments and fighting back and forth, and it's it's a... They're carnal. Paul says you guys are carnal. <laughs> so how is it? So I don't understand. How is it that they can be carnal and immature and let they and yet they have all of these spiritual gifts in operation? Well, it, it was just an, it, how can the charismatic movement have all these spiritual gifts in operation and, and be so deluded? How can they be so spiritually immature? How can they be so lacking in spiritual fruit? Of course, I'm speaking generally. But the point is that just because you have spiritual gifts, it does not mean that you have spiritual fruit, and it does not mean that you have spiritual maturity. Because the reason is, it is the Spirit who works as He wills and not as we will. It's the Spirit. And I... I, I think another misconception is that we tend to think of spiritual gifts as something that we possess and something that we exercise and something that uh, we go on a retreat and we go through this process of trying to identify what our spiritual gift is. And then we take that and we work it. You know, like if you have a gift of artistry, then you paint pictures and you do stuff. If you have a gift of music, then you sit down and you play music or you write music. If you have a gift of writing, then you sit down and you write books or you write articles or things. And I think that we have taken spiritual gifts along the same lines as someone who is naturally gifted and talented in something, and that we can just start working that gift. Well, I have the gift of this, so I'm just going to start doing these behaviors uh, and exercising my gift. But I think we've lost sight of the fact that it is the Spirit. It's not me. It's the Spirit who works as He wills. It's not as we will. Verse 11, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. It's not as I will. If it was up to me, I would not give spiritually immature people spiritual gifts. But let me ask you a question. If they don't have the spiritual gifts that are designed to help them to grow spiritually, how are they going to grow spiritually? 
That's why the Spirit gives those gifts. It's not to reward them for their spiritual maturity. It's to help them towards spiritual maturity. <laughs> right? So uh, that, that's why they're gifts. He gives those gifts to build us up, to strengthen us, to edify us, not to build ourselves up, but to build each other up so that we can grow up into Christ. And that's what edification is all about. It's not about building the building. It's about building the people and it's building one another up in love and in a Christ centered faith, not a church centered faith. So if you take the position that only spiritually mature people should have spiritual gifts that Paul is talking about, then it's it is a catch 22. It is a conundrum. It's a paradox. I can't have the spiritual gifts unless I'm spiritually mature, but I can't become spiritually mature without the spiritual gifts. (laughs) <laughs> so what's the solution well you look in corinthians and you see they're carnal they haven't grown but they are exercising spiritual gifts and why is that because the holy spirit is working it's not them it's the holy spirit and the holy spirit is overriding their immaturity the holy spirit is overriding their lack of fruitfulness and exercising spiritual gifts for the point for the purpose of helping them to grow spiritually so that they can get to the place that they need to be. And the other benefit is that those who are spiritually mature can exercise their gifts of edification and build up uh, others who are less mature. And that's the whole point is that we're coming together and we're exercising these spiritual gifts not to show off about our skills and our abilities because it is the spirit. It's not us. It's the spirit who works as he wills, not as we will. And that's why it's possible that you can have spiritual gifts and not have spiritual fruit. So I'm saying don't be content with the spiritual gift. And there's lots of gifted people. Oh, there's lots of spiritual gifts out there. And you see people exercising their spiritual gifts leaving aside the question of whether or not they are genuinely being led by the Spirit or not. I think a lot of what you see is not Uh, Spirit-led. It's just the carnal imagination, the fleshly imagination of men and women who think they're being led by the Spirit, and actually they're being led by their own selves. Or worse, maybe they've been deceived by a demonic spirit. So, But leaving aside that whole question, yes, it is possible for people who are carnal, which means they're not spiritual, and yet they exercise spiritual gifts. So my point, of, my point is not to judge a person's spiritual maturity by the fact that they operate or they use or they have or God uses them in a spiritually gifted way. There are lots of gifted people who are not fruitful, lots of gifted people who who are not mature in a Christ-centered faith. So then let's go back to verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For the For, in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. 
And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. All right, so let's take a look. Uh, He's illustrating, he's using the idea of a body actually to illustrate the different operations, the different manifestations of spiritual gifts, but that leads that leads him to this idea of what it is to be part of the ecclesia, part of the fellowship of the Son, and it's the idea, the illustration, the analogy of one body with many members. So let's take a look at it. He's illustrating the different manifestations of the Spirit, and he's using the, the illustration of a body One body having many members, and the body of Christ, he says, is composed of many members. In other words, many different parts. But it's the same body. And he makes the point. If if you cut off a part, then uh, it's, it's not a complete body. God designed, look at your body. God designed your body to be whole, to be complete. Uh, You are one person. You are one body. You don't have part of you in one place and part of you someplace else. Uh, You are one body composed of many members, many different parts. And just as the Spirit manifests in each according to His will, so God has set the members in the body just as He pleased. So remember before it says in uh, in 12.7, 1 Corinthians 12.7, the manifestation of the Spirit is, is given to each one for the profit of all. And then in verse 18, he says, Now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. So who sets you in the body of Christ? God does. Why are you where you are? Because God set you to be where you are. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to stay there. I mean, you can't take this analogy to an extreme that, you know, once a right hand, always a right hand. You know, my right hand is not going to change positions and become a left hand. You know, my left hand is not going to change positions and become a a right foot. Uh, So when God sets the body, when he creates your body, uh, those members are set. They're they're there. The the parts are set, and they're not going to to change uh, position. It may change appearance. You know, as we get older and and you know, things happen to our body and changes uh, occur. But your right hand is still your right hand. Your left arm is still your your left arm. I would suggest that um, it it. We probably do not want to take that analogy to the extreme and suggest that wherever you are now is exactly uh, where you will always be, because I believe that uh, Paul also talks about the fact that the body of Christ is growing and developing. And so uh, it's very possible since God sets the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleases it's very possible that God, according to his good pleasure, can move you uh, wherever he wants you to be. So so don't overanalyze this, but just take the basic uh, interpretation. Just take the basic analogy that Paul is getting to is that you as a body are comprised of many members, but all those members are still one. Nevertheless, there is a diversity even within your own body. He says, some members are visible. Some members are invisible. I mean, when we think of body parts, we're thinking mostly about what we can see on the outside. There's a lot more that you don't see on the inside, and all of that is very important. You couldn't have the outside without the inside. So in the same way, some members of the body of Christ are more visible. They may look like that that they are more public or that you can see what they are doing, But I believe that just like in a physical body, there are some parts of the body that you see outwardly. There is much more going on beneath the surface that you don't see. And in in many ways, many respects, those invisible hidden members are more important, or at least as important as what you see outwardly. But Paul's point is each one of them are important and each part makes its own contribution 
just as God has determined it. Who sets people in the body? God sets them in the body according to his will, just as he pleased. We don't just decide what we want to do, but we we respond to what God is doing and we cooperate with where he has placed us. Again, I think he can place us in different places in different times and seasons according to his good pleasure, but not according to ours. <laughs> so one body, many members. And therefore, Paul says, if one of you suffers, all of you will suffer. If one rejoices, all rejoice. And that is just, again, illustrating the fact that we are many different people, many different members, many different um, uh, backgrounds and locations. But if we are all baptized, Paul says, by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. It's not talking about the baptism of water. It's not talking about joining the church. It's talking about by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, and we have all been made to drink into one body. Spirit. So it is the Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who anoints us, who fills us, who who is the evidence that we have been baptized into one body of Christ. So therefore, God desires unity in Christ without division. So that's why Paul says, you know what, when I, I hear that there are divisions among you, and he is he is upset with them for the fact that when you gather together uh, and and you're supposed to be celebrating the Lord's Supper as a love feast, as a testimony of your unity. But instead, there are divisions among you. God desires unity in Christ without division. Now, there are many people in the religious system the ecumenical movement is all about unity, but I'm suggesting it's not unity that God is after. It is unity and oneness in Christ that God is after. So trying to bring all the religions together and let's set aside our differences and let's just all be brothers and sisters in God or in Allah or in Jehovah or in Mother Earth or whatever your God or, or male or female deity is. Let's set all of that aside and just come together as brothers and sisters in this great ecumenical movement. We don't embrace that because that denies the preeminence of Christ, who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So it's not just unity. It's not just basic Unity of let's all let's set aside our differences and all come together because we all worship God in our own way and we call him or her different things. But um, let's come together as human beings and worship whatever deity we feel like we want to worship. <laughs> so that's not the kind of unity that Scripture is talking about. That's not what. Paul is talking about. It's talking about that you have all been baptized by one spirit into the body of Christ. In Christ is where the divisions are broken down. It's when we focus on our fellowship in Christ, in the Lord Jesus, that we can set aside our differences. We can set aside our doctrinal nuances. We can set aside our geography and our time and space and wherever we may be in in all the world. Uh, when we have a relationship with Jesus and we are walking in the light and, and, and we are enjoying the fellowship of the Son, there is a unity and a communion and a fellowship that naturally, and you could also say supernaturally, exists. It's, it is supernatural. And it is obvious that if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We have fellowship with those who are walking in the light. So God desires unity in Christ. Without division, he says he doesn't want any schism in the body. I mean, just imagine if you tried to exist and your body parts were spread all over the place. You wouldn't exist at all. You would be dead if your body parts were scattered. 
And in the same way, Paul is saying that God desires us to be one, and we are one body in Christ, but we are members individually. But as a member, you can't separate yourself from the body. Now, once again, if your paradigm of church is church is the meeting that we attend, church is the building that we go to, church is the service that we perform, church is the fellowship that we participate in, then you would have to conclude that people who don't participate can't be part of the church, can't be part of the body of Christ. But the body of Christ is not based upon church attendance because the body of Christ is not based on geography. It's not based on on denomination. It is not based on church attendance. It's not based on church growth in the sense of a religious system. It's the family of God. It's the people of God. So God desires unity in Christ without division that can only be achieved when our spiritual oneness is based on Christ, based on our fellowship with him. And I would say to you, that fellowship, that spiritual oneness basically transcends all of the the spirit, uh, all of the, the doctrinal and denominational and religious boundaries that people and walls that people put up around themselves. Our unity in Christ is not based on doctrinal nuance. It's not based on denomination. It's not based on religious system or geography. So that is the unity in Christ. Christ is what binds us together. We're not bound together because we agree on everything. It's not even necessary that we agree on everything, just that we agree on one thing, that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by him. And it's the testimony of Jesus. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God does not have life. So this life, this life in Christ that we share, that is the basis of our fellowship. Now, if you make the basis of fellowship anything else, there's going to be division. We're going to attract people. And we'll be attracted to people who think like we think, who believe like we believe in all of these other areas. And that's how divisions are formed. Because for us to bond around a certain belief, it means that others who don't have that belief are not welcome or they're just not going to be attracted to us. They're going to create another group with different beliefs. And so the only way that we can come together in a Christ-centered fellowship is that Christ is having the preeminence in us. And it's not necessary, if that's in place, it's not necessary that we all agree on the same teaching. If you make the teaching, if you make the doctrine, what you believe about certain things, if that becomes the basis of fellowship, I'm telling you it's uh, it's not going to last It creates more division uh, than unity. And these are the sorts of divisions that the devil loves to uh, have us focus on. So we are one body in Christ. We go back to uh, our text and picking up again in verse 28 as we consider one ecclesia and many functions. God has appointed these in the ecclesia. So, once again, the Spirit gives to each one, according to his will, these manifestations of the Spirit. God sets those in the body, those members, according to his pleasure. And then God has appointed these in the ecclesia, he says, verse 28, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. 
So again, and, and this is the third layer in the, the third section in the chapter here. So we've talked about one spirit with many gifts. We've talked about one body with many members. Now we're talking about one ecclesia with many functions. So just as one body has many members, so the ecclesia has many functions that God has appointed. Well, who appoints them? God appoints them. You know, it, and sometimes when Paul describes this, that um, that it says that they laid hands on someone and, and appointed them as elders, it's more of a confirmation of what God has already appointed than it is Paul just saying, well, I, I think you would be a good elder. You meet the qualifications. Let's make the um, give you the blessing and lay our hands on you, and we appoint you to be the elders. If you take... Uh, if you take that out of context, it looks like Paul, it looks like the apostles are going around and appointing these people. Uh, so you have to consider the whole uh, testimony of Scripture. And what we see here is Paul's understanding is that apostles are basically confirming and affirming the ones that God has appointed. And if you look in the book of Acts, you will see that um, that is referenced in a, in a few occasions that that the Holy Spirit selected and the Holy Spirit chose. And the apostles basically laid hands on people to affirm that, yes, this is whom the Holy Spirit has chosen. But see, religion has now taken that, and now uh, it's men who appoint men, leaders who appoint other leaders uh, under them. And uh, we've got this whole organizational chart, this whole hierarchy of carnal men leading other carnal men. And they think that this is the structure and, and, and they think that this is what scripture is teaching is that there's an organizational chart, a top down leadership hierarchy, an organizational tree. And they say, well, yeah, everything you're saying, it contradicts the Bible. You have to have order. You have to have leaders. You have to have this, this chart. You have to have uh, people in charge and. Uh, they see a corporate organizational chart when they look at scripture. And a lot of them will go to this and they say, well, here you, here you are. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and so forth. And so Paul's giving us uh, the order of importance. No, first, second, and third here is not referring to a top-down hierarchy, it's referring, referring to the order of their appearance. Apostles are foundational. You have to start someplace, and apostles are the foundation. Now, the foundation has to go in first. You can't build anything unless you have a foundation. And so Paul says, I have laid a foundation uh, for you, and that foundation is Christ, and nobody else can lay another foundation except Christ. So Christ is the foundation. That's what apostles do. And so they are first in the sense that you have to build upon Christ before you can do anything else. You can't. That's why we say the fellowship is based on Christ. The unity in the body of Christ is based on Christ. You can't base it on something else. You can't build upon another foundation other than Christ. And so apostles are foundational, which means they have to go first in the building of, of this holy temple. It's a spiritual house of living stones, and you start with the foundation, which is Christ, but that also means, as Paul would, would point out, that apostles are at the bottom, not at the top. They're at the bottom. <laughs> so if you, if you think about the construction of a building, you start with the foundation, everything is built on top of it, and you may not see that foundation anymore once the building is completed because the apostles are at the bottom <laughs> because they're foundational. So after that comes prophets. After that comes teachers. So don't look at first, second, and third and imagine your 21st century organizational chart that this is God's blueprint for how the church is supposed to be organized. It's a, it's the, the ecclesia is living uh, just as Christ is living, just as the Holy Spirit lives and speaks and moves, it's the Holy Spirit who operates according to his will. It's God who puts people where he wants them to be. And so Paul is not 
uh, giving them job descriptions. And something else important is he is not explaining and defining and teaching exactly what these different things are. He's making a larger point. So in the context of this chapter, the answer to his rhetorical questions there is, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? So in the context of what he's been saying all along, the answer is no. All of them don't do these things, and they're not supposed to, (laughs) right? God does not want one member doing everything, nor does he want all members doing all things. That's the whole point. You've got one spirit with different gifts divided up individually according to his will. You have God who sets many members in the body according to his pleasure, and they all can't be the same thing. God doesn't want them to be the all, to, to all be the same thing. He doesn't want them to all do the same thing. So the focus shouldn't be on who we are and what our gift is. And it's possible that God wants to use you in many different ways. And so don't get locked into this one thing that, well, I am this, and therefore I'm never going to be that. Because it's not up to you, it's up to God. And God does as he pleases. It, 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 this is his ecclesia. Jesus says, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And men will try to, to contaminate it. But if we let Jesus be in charge and we let the Spirit lead us and let the Spirit govern everything that we do, and we allow God to, to be God and to do as he pleases, with the different members of the body of Christ, then we'll find that each of us, each member is gifted with something and every member contributes exactly what God wishes them to contribute. Now, having said that, I will say this, every member has something to contribute. And if you have body parts that don't contribute to the body, they become dead weight. They become excess. They take more than they give. And unfortunately, if we don't have a vision of the body of Christ and ourselves as members of that body gifted with something, able to contribute, called to contribute, called to serve, called to help, called to edify one another with whatever God has given us to contribute, But we just sit back and relax. We become passive recipients, takers instead of givers, spectators instead of participants. Then that is exactly the situation that the religious system finds itself in. 80% of the people sit back and just watch the preacher perform. They shuffle in, they shuffle out. And that is not God's intention for the ecclesia. Now, Paul is going to share with them, and we'll get into next time, the more excellent way. And that more excellent way is love, and it's the reason why we exercise any spiritual gift at all. And it's not to build ourselves up, but it's to build up others. It's for helping other people. It's for encouraging, edifying, strengthening one another. And that's, that, that's been his whole theme throughout this book here, throughout this letter, whether it's fellowshipping in the Lord's Supper or whether it's loving one another, serving one another with spiritual gifts. It all has to do with love, and love is the more excellent way. And, I, and we'll get into this more next week, but why is love the more excellent way? than desiring the best gifts. He does say desire the best gifts or desire the greater gifts, desire those spiritual gifts that are going to encourage and help and build up one another. It's impossible. I guess it, well, it's not impossible because people do it in a self-centered way, but it's impossible to exercise spiritual gifts uh, and and have them fulfill the purpose for which they are given if we do them in a self-centered way, if we do them to lift ourselves up 
instead of serving one another. So the more excellent way that we'll dig into next week is that if if you walk in love, love will teach you, love will lead you, love will instruct you in how best to serve. Whether it's serving with your gift, serving with your function, serving with whoever you are, serving whoever is in front of you. In whatever circumstance you find yourself, the more excellent way is love, and that is where we are maturing into who God wants us to be, irrespective of whatever gift he may be pleased to use us with. So if we were to summarize it, you know, it is interesting that Paul did not deal, and I have not dealt with, the specifics of each spiritual gift. Well, what is what is speaking in tongues, and what is the word of wisdom, and what is the word of knowledge, and what are these different things? Paul does not deal with the specifics of each spiritual gift. He names them. He acknowledges them. He doesn't give us any details of how apostles, prophets, teachers, and these others function within the ecclesia. He names them, but he doesn't give us any details. Instead, he has focused on the principle of what I will call unity in diversity. Different gifts, but one spirit who gives them. Different ministries, but the same Lord who directs them. Different functions, but the same God who works all in all. So the main takeaway from this is the principle of love. Regardless of our particular gift, ministry, or function, we are all members of the same body of Christ. And so we should use our gifts not to compete with one another for greatness, but to edify, encourage, and build each other up in Christ. If you'd like to get additional teachings, audio recordings, books, and other Christ-centered resources to help you grow spiritually, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com.